really great. Thank you. Perfect. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Anthony Capitillo. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Biologist for the Nez Perce Tribe, uh, the, the Department of Fisheries Resources. I'm here today to discuss the issues that are surrounding zebra and quagga mussels and how people have been monitoring for them and the ways that we've been preventing invasions in the Pacific Northwest. So the zebra and quagga mussels are both freshwater mollusks. The uh, adult zebra mussels can reach about one quarter to half an inch in size with the D-shaped shells and they have a pointed hinge. Their stripes alternate in colors and can either be brownish, tan, or yellow. The color, however, is not always what you want to depend on when you're trying to identify the zebra and quagga mussels because oftentimes they can look pretty similar. Um, so if you really want to distinguish between the two of them, you could set them up on their edges. One has more of a rounded edge. So when you set them up on a flat surface, the quagga mussel will actually topple over and the triangle shape of the zebra mussel will kind of allow it to stand a little bit. But the number one way that you can tell an invasive mussel from a native mussel in, in our areas, especially in America, is that the invasive mussels have what they call bisel threads, which allows them to attach to hard surfaces. The native mussels that we have do not attach to hard surfaces. They actually burrow into the sediment. And so if you find any mussels that are attached to anything, that's a really good indication that it's definitely an invasive one. And so... They basically start out as, as larvae and we call them villagers and they float around in the water column. And after up to about eight weeks, they can undergo metamorphosis and they begin to develop their shells. And once they start to develop their shells, they can kind of attach onto hard surfaces, but there could be a point where they become detached and could reattach somewhere else, which would be kind of a secondary settlement. But once they become permanently attached to some place, that's basically where they stay and they mature there and they're ready to reproduce and they're finished with their settler stage. And once they're able to reproduce, basically the only thing that's stopping them is the conditions of the environment that they're in. So with the single zebra or quagga mussel, you could, they could filter out about 1.5 liters a day and they can both tolerate temperatures of between about one to 30 degrees Celsius. And the zebra and quagga mussels are both broadcast spawners, which means that they release their eggs and sperm into the water column. And that's basically how they kind of settle out. And the female can actually generate up to a million eggs per year. Uh, the zebra mussels begin to reproduce when the waters reach above about 12 degrees Celsius. And the quagga mussels will begin, have begun their reproduction in water as cold as nine degrees Celsius. And once their reproduction starts, it can and will often continue until those temperatures are no longer in that desired range. And there is one area that I was able to find that does have these conditions year round, and that's the Parker Dam on the lower Colorado River. So, and they actually do have issues with these invasive mussels. So year round, these mussels are actually able to spawn in, in that area, in that reservoir. And so it's a really big issue for them because of that. And so thankfully in our area, our waters have, don't stay that warm throughout the year, so it's not as much of an issue, but it's definitely going to be as climate conditions continue to change. But also another thing that you can look at when you're worried about whether your waters are going to be invaded or not is keeping an eye on the calcium um, because they, they need a certain level of calcium in order for their shells to develop, but that's not always what you want to depend on because there are other environmental and water quality conditions that could support their growth and, and survivability, even without the perfect calcium levels for them to actually develop their shells. So the calcium could be a good indication of, of whether or not your waters could be susceptible, but it's not something that you definitely want to depend on, um, especially when you have different types of water bodies in your area and you have lakes that are pretty close to each other and the ecology of those lakes could be a little bit different. And so they might survive in one area because there's plenty of calcium, but then they get to another area where it's a little bit warmer and the water quality supports them a little bit more, just keeping an eye on those conditions. And even as climate conditions change, they're finding that these levels and those thresholds are actually starting to improve. So these mussels are able to withstand lower calcium levels or higher temperatures or even colder temperatures too. So their, their survivability is actually adapting to these areas that we're in, which is also a big concern. And so with the issues and impacts that they have, there's pretty widespread. 
but basically they can completely collapse a food web and basically starts at the platonic base because they feed on plankton as filter feeders and they very easily outcompete the native mussels because of their ability to reproduce and disperse so widely. And so they're out competing for space, they're out competing for food. And at the same time, while they're reproducing and growing, they're smothering anything that's underneath them. And they're even smothering other generations of invasive mussels as they continue to grow and build on top of each other. And, and in a lot of cases, the native mussels are getting completely eradicated from some of these systems because the impacts are so big and invasive mussels are even building up on the native mussels, keeping them from being able to open and filter feed themselves or expel waste or breathe or anything. So they're just completely altering these food web systems and messing with these native mussels that are here. And the over filtering of the water causes sunlight to penetrate even deeper into the water columns. Sometimes that can support invasive plants that could be there while harming the native plants are there. And so that has an effect on the water quality as well. The pH balances start to change, the waters become more acidic. And they're actually finding that the presence of zebra and quagga mussels are kind of tying to some of these toxic algae blooms because they're affecting the water quality so bad that the toxic algae blooms are coming up sooner and the, and the toxic algae seasons are lasting longer. And so there's other impacts that are coming out of that too that we might not have noticed that first that we've already had issues with, but it's actually making those issues more widespread and last a lot longer. And so when it comes to these recreational activities that we enjoy, like fishing, hunting, boating, swimming, all of this is going to be affected by the change in the water quality and the change in the landscape because the zebra and quagga mussels are so sharp that they can cut people's feet up, they can cut animals, the fish can't really build their nests in the, in the gravel anymore because of the sharp stuff that's in there. The water quality is gone and then the regulations are going to change too. We're not going to, we're going to lose access to certain areas. We're going to lose access to certain species that we're fishing for. And so all of these changes are going to trickle down through our recreational activities. They're going to go into our industrial activities, our industrial or our agriculture. And when you look at the Pacific Northwest, you see that there's a lot of dams that we have along the Columbia River and then in the Snake River as well. And those dams are going to have to start changing the regulations. They're going to have to go through certain construction changes. They're going to have to go through procedure changes. Like the way that they operate, not just the dams, our hatcheries too, or fish hatcheries, they're all going to have to change the way they intake water, the way they expel water, the way that they interact with ships or anything that's coming in or going out. Everything's going to change. And all of those changes have a cost that's associated with them. And all of those costs are going to trickle down to the consumers. We're the ones that are going to have to pay for those. All the extra maintenance, all the extra work that goes into preventing these species from spreading or fixing the problems that they're causing, we're going to have to pay for those on our end. And the prices are just going to, are just going to rise and rise and inflation is going to go crazy. The food industry is going to struggle because it's going to be harder to water our crops. It's going to be harder to ship the foods from the snake, up the Snake River through the Columbia because the barges are going to have to go through all these different procedural changes and regulations. And, and so it's just very, very widespread what these issues can be. And all of it basically comes down to money. All of it's going to be felt through money and loss of land, loss of resources, and a lot, none of it is affordable. We can't afford any of it, honestly. And so when it comes to distribution, the zebra mussels are native to the Caspian Sea and the quaggas came from Ukraine and Russia, but both have made it to America about the late 1980s. And they were first seen in the Great Lakes and ever since they've spread to over 24 states throughout the United States. In 2007, they finally crossed the 100th meridian where they came into the Western United States. And so far out of all the invasions, there's only been two water bodies that I was able to find that have successfully removed these invasive mussels. And one of them was Lake Waco in Texas. And they first identified the invasive mussels in September of 2014. It was believed that there was a barge that was responsible for their introduction. The owner of the barge was cited for introducing an illegal species. And by October of 2014, multiple agencies coordinated and they actually covered the areas where the mussels were with black tarps and smothered them. And the black tarps were removed by March of 2015. And ever since then, they haven't had any positive detections in the lake. So it appears that it was successful in their removals. But it took a very big coordinated effort. And 
the very early detection to catch that. And the other one was in 2002, a, qu a query in Virginia was invaded and they actually used a potassium mixture to kill the invasive muscles that were there. And that one was a very, very costly uh, activity that they had. It cost about $400,000 for them to do the chemical treatment and to also do further monitoring of that query to make sure that everything was success successful and that nothing came in. And the only reason that both of these were able to eradicate those muscles from their areas is because for one, they were able to detect them very, very early. And two, they were able to remove anything that was suspect for introducing those invasives. And three, it, they had a lot of people that coordinated together. So without the coordination, without the, the removal of the suspect introduction ve vectors and without the early detections, they would still be dealing with this now. Um, and so that is a very big part of it is getting everybody together as soon as you find out and having that rapid response to get the removal going. And so the other means of dispersal basically is recreational watercrafts and equipment, muscles hitchhiking on plants that are caught in watercrafts or gear, caught on trailers. Uh, it could be through aquarium releases, restoration projects that are in or around waterways, through gears, tools, and equipment, fishing and hunting in and around waterways. There's animals that have invasive muscles either on their fur and their paws. And in Quebec, actually, there was a fish that was found that had a zebra muscle actually attached, or no, a quagga muscle that was attached to it. Or no, it was a Quebec a zebra muscle, sorry. But it was a lake chub that had an invasive muscle attached to it. So that just goes to show that if there's a hard surface that they attach to and they're able to get the resources they need, they will attach to anything. And so another thing that you got to watch out for is retail stores, because there was a moss ball incident where there was some invasive muscles going to pet stores and there's a big recall, big thing that went on there. So there's different ways that these things can get out there. So keeping an eye on all the different vectors and different pathways that these can get out there and, and knowing what's going on and who's doing what to prevent these is definitely a key in protecting our areas. And so here you can see a map of the different watercraft inspection stations and decontamination areas. And you can see, especially in the Pacific Northwest where a lot of these are kind of around the borders of where like the main highways and, and areas are where people are traveling from the east coming this way. And then when you look down south a little bit further, you can see where a lot of these blue dots are. These are actually water body stations where there's possible invasions or there's suspect and anything that's coming out of that water they're concerned about. So down south, they're concerned about anything that's coming out of the water. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, we're concerned about anything that's coming into the states. And so you can see the different types of stations that kind of attribute to the level of, of awareness that we're trying to, to share with the public and, and protection that we have. And on here, you can actually see the distribution of the invasive muscles and how they've gotten to certain areas and they either failed or were successful. And then I kind of, I put a red circle around Lake Powell here because when you look to the right on this other map, you can see where Lake Powell does have some muscle occurrences and boats that were in Lake Powell were seen in other areas in California and Nevada and in Idaho, Washington. And so without those watercraft inspection stations, there's a very good chance that we would already be dealing with these issues here. And I'm hoping that this link will work. Let's see, because I wanted to show just kind of the progression of the invasion that, that kind of came through here. Uh, that started in the Great Lakes and made its way across the east. You can kind of see how it started. And there's just a big boom where just kind of recreational watercrafts and other people traveling because there wasn't awareness that was going on at that time. So it was really easy for them to spread. And they spread pretty far and pretty wide. And a lot of it was natural too, because they followed the waterways. They traveled downstream to the waters. And so it's not just people that are spreading them. They're, they're spreading naturally as well. And so there we got the, the zebra mussels that was that one. And then we got the quagga mussel here on the other one. So you can kind of see the differences between them because one came a little bit earlier and then the other one just kind of is overlaying one species, invasive species is overlaying the other invasive species. And so they're trying to kind of competing with each other as they're out competing the native species. But you can see where there's really big booms in these warmer areas where the waters are hot uh, for longer periods of the year. And 
So those conditions are really supportive. So they really took off in those areas. And so being aware of where these hotspots are, where our protections are, like the watercraft inspection stations, decontamination, being aware of where those areas are and how we're protecting ourselves is definitely a big step and making sure that they don't make it to our areas. And so here you can see kind of some of the monitor, monitoring and prevention that's been going on. And there's definitely a growing interest in kind of keeping track of what's going on in our areas. Um, there's a lot of campaigns that are going on out there, the Play Clean Glow, uh, Play Clean Go, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, Clean Drain Dry, the Invasive Muscle Collaborative. Then you got the 100 Meridian uh, Initiative. All of these campaigns are to focus on stopping the spread of invasive species. Then you got different sampling methods that are kind of helping us determine is there a presence or an absence like the Velager net toes or the eDNA sampling, you know, is there a presence or an absence of the species here? And then we can put out the sampling plates and live samplers so we can actually look at population densities and different life stages. And what's really cool is that Washington actually has a couple of dogs. I think one just retired, but they have another one um, that that's kind of making the rounds now around Washington, but they go to different watercraft inspection stations and they actually sniff out for these invasive mussels. So they're actually training dogs to sniff out invasive mussels now. And in other areas, if there's a really big issue like this here with the boat, the red boat in the middle of the tank, that's a hot water tank. I think it's 120 degree water that they dip the boat into and they run the water through the systems and everything to make sure that any invasives that are in there get killed. And I think they have to be in that tank for about 10 minutes, I believe. I'd have to look at that again. But there's definitely a lot going on out there to try and prevent and keep track of what's going on and what's coming in and out of the states. But then you look over, over at the removal efforts and there's kind of some controversy with some of it because some of it, they're using chemicals in the waters. And so you have to really look at how are the native species being affected? How is the ecosystems being affected by these chemicals? And even with the black tarp that they put down in Texas, any native species that were under that black tarp could be smothered and killed just the same as invasive species. So having bubble barriers in different areas to kind of contain those chemicals, knowing how much of the chemical you can use, what chemicals are harmful to native species while being harmful to the invasives like the potassium. And then just realizing how much effort actually goes into hand removals. And if you have to do a hand removal, it's gonna take a lot of manpower. It's gonna take a lot of money. It's gonna take a lot of effort. And then you might not actually remove everything out of those areas. You might just be kind of clearing areas that are important like around water intakes or places where people like to fish and, and, and recreate. But then you have muscle repel or repellents and those kind of work a little bit, but calcium starts to build up on them. Other buildup kind of gets onto those muscle repellents. And then those actually end up not working after a while either. And then when it comes to draining certain waterways, which is kind of one of the most effective ways, just completely draining, but you can't always drain a body of water. If it's a river, you can't really drain the river or if it's a lake, you you have to think about what else is in that lake before you drain it. If there's a species in there you want to protect, or maybe you have to remove before you drain it, then there's going to be a lot of cost and work that goes into that as well. And so with tribal involvement, it's always important, especially when it comes to natural resources and, and, and cultural resources, especially because we're not just protecting the salmon or the steelhead, we're protecting our culture, we're protecting our identity, and we're, we're protecting the environment that all of us rely on. And when the tribe, tribes are involved in this, we're ensuring that the best practices are coming forward. We're ensuring that if there is a chemical that's going to be used, it's not a chemical that's going to be overused. It's going to be used in a way that's going to support the work that's being done and not ruin species habitat or or survivability in that waterway. We're gonna make sure that if any removals are gonna be done that we know what the impact of those removals are and what it's gonna to take to, to conduct those removals, the money that goes into it. And then collaborating is a big part too. With the Nespers tribe, we have to collaborate with a lot of different entities because we work in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and we, and we still have some activities that occur in Wyoming and Montana as well. And so have, being able to collaborate with different agencies in different states and different funding sources, you know, it's just, it's 
always going to be an obstacle that you have to overcome, but overcoming those obstacles is very important because you're going to strengthen the, the protection that we have in place without everybody collaborating, collaborating, we wouldn't know when a muscle is moving across the state line, when it's coming out of a body of water. As soon as a muscle comes from body of water, we know what's going on because there are networks in place that tell us, hey, there's an alert over here. We got a, a boat coming out. It's got muscles on it. It's on its way to the west. Keep an eye out for it. So those watercraft inspection stations can locate it, track it down, and decontaminate it if needed. And so basically just if you need any information, look on those websites. There's a lot of information out there now. There's a whole bunch of resources, a lot of campaigns going on. And so it's really important to just kind of keep your finger on the pulse to know like who's doing what and where. So that way everybody can stay collaborated together. Everybody's on the same page and we're all working towards the same goal. Um, and so it's just, it's all a working effort because once these muscles get here, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. And it takes millions of dollars to even deal with the issues, not even remove them, just dealing with the issues alone. And so just be vigilant, inspect your watercrafts, make sure that if you're going in and out of a waterway that's infested, make sure that you do everything you can to protect yourself, protect your resources, protect your communities. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony.